I don't know if the Celtics can move forward with Jalen Brown as their number two. Because when you look at the entire NBA, contenders and teams that actually get it done, very seldomly does your number two have no playmaking skill. And when I watched Jalen Brown play from his second year in the league in 2018 to 2023, his growth as a passer has been marginal. And it's not just that he had a wrist and a hand injury that limited him to 20% three-point shooting in this postseason run, truly ugly numbers. It was the fact that I think Jalen Brown has actually regressed. Now, when you look at the box score, this year he averaged a career high in points at 27 per game. He averaged seven rebounds. Jalen Brown is fantastic for a team that is looking to get into the playoffs. And the second rounds, he will continue to be one of the best players on the floor. But in order for the Celtics to get to where they want to go, I think we have seen too many different series where he has underperformed and or he and Jason Tatum have not played well together. And I think a lot of Celtic fans ask the question, why do they seldomly just not play at the same level consistently? And I think it's because Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown do the same exact things, but Brown does it at an inferior level, and he's also not a complimentary player to Tatum. There are certain moments where he makes the right read. He's quick, and he's actually passing well. But then in a game seven, he has eight turnovers, goes one of nine from three-point range, and along the way, he fails to communicate defensively. I'm okay with Jalen Brown having eight turnovers if we're actually going to talk. Like, if you and I are defending a ball screen, Brandon, and I don't say a single word to you, and then we let up a wide-open three, multiple possessions in a row, there'd probably be something wrong with me. And yet when Jalen Brown does that, we continue to prop him up as one of the best two-way players in the league, though he never communicates defensively. I'm not asking you to be a vocal leader. I'm asking you to do the simple things. He's turnover-prone. He's foul-prone on both ends of the floor. And I think for a team that has to pay their two stars 35% supermaxes this offseason, you have to ask yourself the question, is it worth committing 70% of our payroll to these two guys when they're repeatedly running into the same exact issues every single postseason? Uh, well said. Uh, listen, as the guy who's been kind of on Jalen Brown's side, since the start of the show, I, I am a Jalen Brown fan, but I have to be honest and say I think he's shown us who he is, and that is a number two. Because uh, when when asked, Jason Tatum gets injured on the very first play. From there on out, basically a couple minutes into the game, you can realize like, okay, Jalen Brown, this is why you're on the team. If, you're, if your lead star is struggling, injured, or whatever the case may be, this is why we have you. This is why we pay you the big bucks. We believe you can take the place and bring us to the promised land. You failed. Badly. Eight for 23. Eight turnovers. You still haven't fixed the handle problems of going left. It's obvious. I don't think it's a skill set thing. I think it is more probably a mental game because we got it. We got to remember too. Sports is a very big mental game, and when you're thinking about it too much, and you're not just like I said with Jimmy, when Jimmy was not going and being aggressive, I said he's in his own head. He's thinking too much. Sometimes you just got to go out there and ball, just hoop, just hoop. Don't even think. It should be natural. Flo like the great. Bruce Lee said, be like water, just flow. And, and sometimes these players get, ra get, it's, so it's I, 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 I am with you. Jalen has, it's, it's disappointing. Uh, it sucks. Not saying he's not a great player. He still is a great player. He's an all-star, he's a star caliber player. Still, he just isn't a superstar, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but John, one of, here's something that was interesting, right? I thought back to one of the first things I said when we started this podcast, I feel like one of the first things I ever said, because we did this right after the finals. And I feel like the question was posed, you know, what happened? How did the Celtics lose and whatever? And I believe one of the first things I ever said was turnovers, turnovers, turnovers. If we remember last year, Jason Tatum had a hundred turnovers in the playoffs. 
the second highest was Jalen Brown by a wide margin, but still. And this year, it's it it, it came again. It, the 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 turnovers for both guys were apparent the entire series. They can't get the handle of the ball. Something about them where they listen, guys. You guys are good enough shooters, basically. It's time to get in the lab and just focus on on the handles or so. I, I I don't know what it is. All right. If it's more mental, then sports psychologists are out there. Go 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 see one. It, it can help, and that's not a shot. That's just you know fact. It can help a lot. Uh, another thing, for their struggles at home, John, I don't blame the Boston crowd because if anybody was listening to reports or people that were there last night before the game, they were comparing it to a college atmosphere. That crowd was raucous. They were ready to go. When you come out and you, sh- I think you missed your first 12 three pointers. It was outside. Like, you kill the crowd. The crowd was trying. Every time that they made a little bit of 5 0 run, 6 0 run, or whatever, even though it was, there was a big lead, the crowd would get into it. And then you, two, one step forward, three steps back, the crowd can't get into it. It's not Boston's. The, the, the fans' fault. They are still a great fan base and a great crowd. The players have to take more accountability. I don't even think it's a lot of Missoula's fault. Obviously, he takes culpability too because, like I said, if you ain't the solution, you're part of the problem. I don't think he should be fired. Um, no way. I do think things will probably be reworked. I think Jalen Brown is probably going to be the guy that they go look. I don't know what the trade is. It better not be James Harden. Because oh, that's hell no. I've got a couple yeah. trades for you. Okay. So the first trade idea I have is one that involves the Portland Trailblazers. Okay. Okay, Damian Lillard. Jalen Brown is the perfect star. But when you're trying to go to the NBA Finals, I do not think when you're trying to win a champ when you're trying to win a championship, though, I do not think Jalen and Jason is the complementary fit that supports one another's weaknesses. Yes. But the Portland Trailblazers are just trying to get into the playoffs. Mm-hmm. They want to move the third overall pick. And if you think about what's going to happen with the second pick, the Hornets are rumored to take Brandon Miller. Mm-hmm. Scoot Henderson is one of the best point guard prospects in recent memory. Mm-hmm. He is basically De'Aaron Fox and John Wall's physique. Mm-hmm. At 19 years old, he's built like a boulder, and he's going to be a much better playmaker with a clear strength and pick and roll as a shooter. What do you think about Jalen Brown to Portland for the third overall pick, the right to select Scoot Henderson, while Portland will also give up Yusuf Nurkic, Bad center, bad contract, but then also Cam Reddish as well to make the salaries work. I don't think Boston would want Nurkic because they already have Horford and um, uh, Williams. Right. That's uh, – see, I would – okay. I mean, it looks all right, but I think Nurkic is going to be the holdup, to be honest with you, for the yeah. Celtics. They wouldn't, they wouldn't want that. And also, you got to look. I know, you know, Scoot is obviously not even just Scoot, uh, prospects in general. Um, you know, they're the shiny new toy. We don't know what they are. Um, we're very hopeful when talking about them. Uh, but we got to remember, we know what Jalen Brown is, basically, right? And he's a very good player. So we, you got to be sure. You got to be sure, or you are going to be in a worse spot than you already are. But continue. Right, and part of the idea behind this is uh, Nurkic is really one of the worst contracts. In the, he, he's going to be owed $70 million, 55 after this year for three seasons, and he does nothing outside of grab rebounds mm-hmm. and put up empty filler points. But the idea is that the Celtics don't want to commit everything to two-star players because the new CBA really does inhibit any team that wants to go $17.5 million over the cap, the cap, and for the Celtics, they would be going well over that, so they wouldn't be able to use the mid-level exception. You wouldn't be able to sign players and buyouts. If you want to make a trade, you can't aggregate two contracts to get the twenty-five million dollars. You can't even trade a pick in seven years if you want to upgrade a certain player. So there's also a couple of more things from the ownership. They pay more. I think the idea is Scoot Henderson won't be making. 15, they'll be making 10, $8 million early on. And that allows them to maintain that core. And maybe they make a couple moves. Maybe you package Yusuf Nurkic and Malcolm Brogdon and you get yourself a win off the bench. 
That's the idea behind it. After that, there really aren't many trades people will like. Bradley Beal, Denny Avia, he's three years older than Jalen, four years older. Like, that's the next best offer. Yeah, see, I think that you get into the same stratosphere of they kind of do some, they're like scorers, they're straight scorers. Like, you kind of want, you know, playmaker, scorer, or a big man. To uh, Beal's credit, nobody watches Washington. I don't watch Washington, but I have watched some Bradley Beal. Uh-huh. Over the last three years without John Wall, he's grown into a good playmaker on the ball, but he hasn't been supported with a number one, which would allow him to play the more ideal role. Uh-huh. I think of Bradley Beal as an upgraded version of Chris Melton. Better defender, better de- better shooter, better decision maker, maybe good enough passer. Yeah, I mean, you see, uh, the average seven assists per game. Yeah, you see how though Middleton has Giannis, which he does a completely different skill set than Middleton. So that's what I'm saying. Like they gotta be different usually. Like it doesn't usually when two guys do very similar things, it doesn't really work that that well. That's what I'm trying. Like like we gotta think of like a, a point guard uh or a center really to get for, so, like, you know, it would never happen, but, like, an Embiid would be, you know, obviously, right? Or uh, name me a De'Aaron point. Fox. De'Aaron Fox or, or Damian Lillard, right? All these guys. Like, mm-hmm. that would be the more ideal route you would want to go 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 towards. Yes. Um, I think the ultimate end game though, here is the Celtics are going to give Jalen Brown a $295 million extension this summer if mm-hmm. he wants to accept it. If he does not accept it, he is going to be traded because there's just one year left in this contract. And if that is the case, I think the end game is that they make a move for the Portland Trailblazers for A, the third pick in Scoot Anderson, or B, let's say the Hornets take Scoot second overall. They make a call to Charlotte, say, we'll give you Brown. We'll take the last year of Goran Harrod's contract. You give us a second overall pick. Now you get an established wing to purple the ball. Uh-huh. Worst case scenario, if the Blazers really want to keep that third pick, you say, give us Anthony Simons who's kind of a baby version of Dame, a light version of Dame, and then Shaden Sharp, who's going to be a superstar, I think, in four or five years, but it's also very, very early for a 19-year-old to say that. Whatever the Celtics decide to do, I think they may have already missed their best shot to win a championship. I think their best opportunity was each of the last two seasons. But because Brown and Tatum didn't play well enough together Mm -hmm. at the peak of it, Mm -hmm. Now you're, you've reached the apex and you're starting to go down the hill. And the quicker they can start to slow that down, the sooner they'll be able to adjust the roster because to get something you've never had, you have to do something you've never done. Mm-hmm. And I do not think Jalen Brown will be the second best player on a Celtics team to win a championship. And what that comes down to is his lack of development in key areas like communication, ball handling, and passing. And he develops one of those three things to a higher enough level, unless Jason Tatum takes that massive jump next year, mm-hmm. I don't think Boston's going to have enough juice in the tank. I don't think they'll be able to go over the hunt, man. I would just say I, I disagree with that simply because looking at the lay of the land for next year, um, it's still as open as it was this year. And l- while I did say I don't – I think they've shown us what they are and that they don't really match up as well, even though they were – you know two games away from winning an NBA championship last year. I do think that they can, like, the Sixers are kind of in disarray right now. Um, The Bucs are getting older. We've we've lamented on their issues. Miami, can they do this again? (laughs) We have no idea. Um, and, And then there's Boston. And, you know, Cleveland is still young. And I think we've seen a lot of Cleveland's problems. And they have to assess a lot of their problems. So I still think Boston, you look at all those teams, they they're going to be a top four, top two team next year in the East, even if they stay completely the same. Uh, so I would say, no, they're not done. Um, but I would honestly say right now I'm sitting at 50, 50, uh, the Celtics are going to make a move this offseason Cause I really starting to think about, I really can see them staying pat and being like, no, let's do this again next year. Cause you know, we do got to say Malcolm Brogdon was a non-factor last two games, last couple of games, actually, when he got injured early in the series. Uh, He shouldn't even have been playing last night. He was 
obviously he missed he missed all of his shots. He he, he was a, a non factor, uh, and he was a big addition to the Celtics team. Grant Williams, I think, is a free agent. He's going to be yeah. gone. I highly doubt he's going to be able to come back. I don't think they're going to be able to afford him. No. Um, and I don't know the other contract situations like Al Horford and, and Rob Williams, but they're locked up for the next. Yeah, I, I would imagine they're locked up. So do the if they make a move, it's either going to be. I could either see them moving smart or brown, um, or both. But if not, they're going to stay pat, and I think they'll still be a top two team uh, next year in the East. They will be. It's not a matter of how many games they win; it's a matter of how far they go. And that is why I say I think we've seen the best version of the Boston Celtics.